Okay. Um, so our first speaker up today is Yan Yan Su. Um, so she's originally from Sichuan. Sorry if I said that wrong, China. <laughs> she got her PhD from the University of Alabama in 2013. Um, after that, she did a short postdoc position at UC Irvine from 2013 to 2015, um, and then she finally became a postdoc here at the CFA uh, from 2015 to 2018. Um, during that time, she was an organizer of the cluster group meeting and also this very own head seminar. Um, she then joined the University of Kentucky as a faculty member in 2019. Uh, her research focuses on multi-wavelength observations of clusters of galaxies, and recently she's expanded the field of machine learning and has been teaching a course on modern data analysis tools in astronomy. Um, and today she'll be talking to us about new discoveries on thermal and uh, chemical properties in the intercluster medium. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Yanyan. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for the very nice introduction. And uh, indeed, uh, those um, few years I spent at uh, CFA as a postdoc is like one of my best memories. It was a super uh, rewarding experience, um, both for my career and personal life. Um, and I definitely miss it and looking forward to visiting CFA someday in person. Um, but also, I'm very happy that I have moved on to University of Kentucky as a faculty. And uh, uh, over the past few years, I have established my own research group. And I got the tremendous support from my uh, students and postdoc. And they are, they are just excellent, especially I have been on maternity leave twice. And, uh, and also, I have trouble. Um, Advancing my slides. <laughs> um, do you want to try unsharing and resharing, or yeah, I, um, just just give me a few seconds. Sorry about that. I, we tested it, but oh no problem. I couldn't uh, get out of it. Um, Sometimes if you click instead of. OK, OK. Now, yeah, it's also my great pleasure to serve the um, community of Central Kentucky. Um, so today I'm going to um, talk about uh, two uh, different aspects of the intercluster medium. Um, one is about uh, uh, the um, multi-phase uh, filaments at the center of cool core clusters, and another is related to the en enrichment process of the intercluster medium. Okay. And so um, I'm going to start with the first one. And uh, so at the center of galaxy clusters and uh, the X-ray um, emission is very, very bright. And so um, we expect that the hot gas should cool and form stars uh, at a very high star formation rate like up to thousand uh, solar mass per year, but to what we observe, the level of star formation is not nearly as much at this high. So something has happened and stopped the gas from cooling and to form stars. And it's almost uh, almost certain that uh, we think that it has something to do with the AGN feedback. As you can see that at the cluster centers like this iconic first year's cluster, and you see that the gas is not uh, super uniform. We see some cavities and uh, ra also radio jets. So, um, so it's very likely like AGN has played an important role in heating up the gas. Um, however, AGN um, feedback for the such uh, low rate shift to uh, like uh, um, BCGs, like uh, uh, they are they are typically uh, radiant passive in galaxies. The aging feedback is in the face of radio mode, so we call it mechanical mode, and it's very puzzling. And how this mechanical mode feedback, this mechanical energy being transported, to couple with the intercluster medium in, in, and eventually heat it up. This exact process is definitely not well understand. Okay, and uh, over the past few years, another um, another discovery about the center of 
um, cool protesters that uh, it is not as red and passive as we thought. And although it's not uh, actively forming stars, it definitely contains um, cold gas. For example, again, this is the iconic Perseus cluster, and we see those very beautiful HR filaments at the temperature of 10 to the 4 um, Kelvin. Um, and also, like uh, it's not just uh, this warm gas, we actually see uh, those such filamentary structures at uh, many different uh, phases. And uh, it's showing from the left to right, those are warm ionized gas, warm molecular gas, and cold molecular gas. Okay. Um, so those multi-phase filaments, well, then again, we believe it has something to do with this um, feedback process. Um, for example, such multi-phase filaments, typically they, they tend to wrap around to, um, x ray cavities. And also um, their, their, um, their velocities, and you can see that they, they typically are very low and they, there's no way they can escape the center of cl cluster. So their fate is like, like uh, almost certain they'll eventually fall back to be accreted onto um, the black hole again. Um, and, uh, um, and we see relatively good alignment between among those multi-phase gas from, from warm ionized to cold molecular, but we do not know um, much about the, the, um, the, the, what, what's their relation relative to the, relate, relative to the hot gas. Um, so recently there is a paper uh, led by Ming's, Ming Sun's group. Um, so they, 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 they studied, uh, uh, and the, I, I believe that's the only other environment in clusters where, where you see this, the coexist of multi-phase gas, that is the stripped tail of jellyfish galaxies. And so uh, they found that, uh, uh, they, you see, they, they inspected uh, um, a number of um, jellyfish galaxies they found that in their tails, the surface brightness of the um, X-ray is highly correlated with the surface brightness of H alpha. So, um, which means that uh, um, X-ray and uh, and uh, warm gas are like uh, definitely they are um, they are related in some way. Um, Perhaps the uh, hot gas and the cold gas have been mixed together and form this warm gas, so it's related to that hot gas, like just cooling and to form warm gas. And so, inspired by this work, we think it's just highly motivated to to take a look at what's going on at the cluster centers, whether we can see uh, relations like this. But cluster centers is much more difficult to study um, compared with jellyfish galaxies because jellyfish galaxies they are typically at like a outside cluster core for sure they are like a, where the uh, surrounding intracluster medium is is much fainter and so so like one can directly identify what's the X-ray emission associated with the galaxy tail itself, but for at the cluster centers it's like the brightest part of of clusters like orders magnitude brighter in X-ray, and uh, the it's uh, it's just so so much contamination, um, and also it's not just uh, the intercluster medium is bright; it's also complicated. And you can see that there is a uh, there is cavities and there is a sloshing from the spiral structure. So to really isolate out the X-ray filament is very challenging work. Um, so this is a new work led by my postdoc, Valeria, and she um, creatively implemented this um, um, modern analysis tool um, it's, um, to decompose um, the, um, the X-ray emission into multiple components. So the trick is not just you take advantage of the imaging part, but also uh, utilizing uh, the information of energy. So using those 3D data to, to decompose the um, intracluster medium um, into multiple components. Um, for example, this is a Perseus cluster. We have recovered the X-ray filaments components 
and isolated from X-ray cavities and this, this sloshing spiral structure. And by using this method, we, we, apply, we apply these methods to um, multiple um, glucose clusters. They are all relatively bright. And we obtained the X-ray brightness directly associated with the X-ray filaments itself, okay, isolated from the surrounding intracluster medium. And we found out that you can see this is a comparison of the X-ray filament and the, uh, their HR file um, image. And you can see that they are highly correlated. Okay. But this correlation doesn't exist if you look at the HR file and uh, the ICM itself directly. So when we put it together, and this is the X-ray and HR file surface brightness relation we got. And if I didn't tell you what this gray gray dash line is, you may think that is the best fit. Um, but no, it's not our best fit. This gray dash line is exactly what um, Ming Sun's group found for jellyfish galaxies. Our best fit is the black dash line. You can see that those two two scaling relations are just just highly consistent, and uh, I I think this result is extremely beautiful. I'm so happy to share it with you because it's uh, it tells us two things. One thing, this is the first time that we truly demonstrate that the 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 multi-phase environment at cluster centers and jellyfish galaxies are really related. And uh, the second thing to demonstrate that at cluster center that the formation of formation of this HR five filaments on multi-phase gas is truly related to uh, the cooling of um, hot gas. And you won't see this relationship if you simply plot the X-ray surface brightness at the position of this HR five filaments. It only showed up after we. Um, manage to isolate it out to the surrounding um, intercluster medium. Um, and also this demonstrate that the, uh, the excitation mechanism to form the multi-phase uh, filaments is local. Okay? It's not related to the global cooling of the intercluster medium. It's, it's related to possibly energetic particles, shocks, and reprocessing of the EUV and X-ray radiation um, from the plasma cooling. Yeah, okay. So um, since we have already come this far, we just take a step forward. We, we compared the, the uh, pressure of X-ray filament to this um, HR filament and the surrounding X-ray halo, and we found out that uh, the within the filament the pressure is really low, and so to to prevent it from collapsing, the, um, this our study um, suggests that uh, um, we expect a level of magnetic field of actually quite high, ten to the uh, um, more than more than ten microgauss within the filaments okay, to keep it stable. Okay, so that. Uh, with that, um, I'm concluding the first part of my talk, and uh, um, Valeria is currently writing a paper on this on its result. So stay tuned, and and now I'm going to move on to the a second part of this talk, and it is about the intracluster the enri enrichment of the intracluster medium um, from centers to VR radii. So. Um, we are all like once inside a star, and uh, so the so the um, chemical abundance that we study are mostly produced um, in um, type one or type um, or core collapse supernovae, and uh, galaxy clusters at the most uh, um, massive gravitational bound systems um, manage to keep all the metals. Um, ever produced within it. So it is a very ideal laboratory to study the enrichment process. So, and you can see this is a comparison of the, um, uh, of the, the spectrum of Perseus cluster and um, 
from a mission from decades ago and uh, today by Hitomi and you can see that uh, um, the spectrum resolution has improved dramatically. Um, yeah, but uh, we can also see that uh, from this spectrum that the intracluster medium is indeed enriched um, and uh, it contains um, many metal lines. So the metallisting, the intracluster medium, we have, I think, I, I would say we generally reached this agreement that uh, at least when it comes to the iron balance measurement, it's, you can, we can see that the uh, cluster center is like, uh, um, has the iron balance peak. Then outside the cluster center, the um, metallisting, uh, the iron balance start to become flat and consistent with 0.3 solar abundance. And this is, there's this result has been generally interpreted as okay the the galaxy clusters has been enriched uh, very early on perhaps before the collapse of galaxy cluster themselves and uh, which explain this uniform iron abundance distribution as to the cluster centers and it has been believed that it has something to do with the, with the BCG some later enrichment and but but to truly um, find out what's going on in the enrichment process, we should look at the abundance, not just iron. We need to look at the abundance pattern. Um, so for cluster centers, I would say the, the result is actually somewhat surprising, especially com um, when com combined with um, the Hitomi measurement of precious cluster, as you can see that, um, mm -hmm. Among all those class abundance ratios we have looked at, they are more or less solar, um, consistent with the solar value. And this result is actually not, not easy to explain. Um, because at cluster centers, we believe it has it's, it's definitely influenced by the BCG, then it's supposed to produce a subsolar alpha to iron abundance ratio. Um, but uh, then again, it has also been enriched by some early enrichment is, and because it's so early on, we, be, we believe it has some super solar alpha to uh, iron abundance ratio. But somehow those two um, sources manage to exactly compensate each other to produce the solar abundance ratios for nearly all clusters we studied so far and for nearly all the um, abundance ratios we look at so far. That's that's quite a coincidence. Um, yeah, so that's for the cluster centers. And for cluster outskirts, I would say the agreement is not as good as cluster centers. Um, as far as I know, there are only two studies have have studied, has presented the, the abundance ratios of cluster outskirts out to their radii. And this Suzaku Key project is one of it. And you can see it's uh, it's uh, about uh, the nearest galaxy cluster Virgo. So it's very expensive to cover it. It has so many Suzaku pointings. And even so that only a small fraction of the outskirts is covered. And, um, and uh, you can see the, the result is like the R4 to R balance ratio. Um, from the centers to the very radii is more or less consistent with our solar abundance, solar values. Um, and the other, the only other study that I know about is led by my former graduate student Anup Sakar, and he is now a postdoc at MIT. And uh, so um, we studied a group. Um, uh, we studied a, a number of galaxy groups, um, different farther away than Virgo. And uh, um, so to, but we creatively like combined Suzaku and Chandra observations and uh, to correct for the modest um, angular resolution of Suzaku. And this work, um, we found that uh, the alpha to iron abundance ratio is indeed consistent with the solar abundance at the center. But uh, when we go outside the cluster centers, we find out this ratio increase and reach to two times solar value at cluster outskirts. It's really interesting that our findings is highly consistent with the predictions from Elastrin's TNG as indicated by this gray, gray line here. Um, 
Okay, so it's actually very difficult to say which one is correct because this study and, and the, this Virgo study, they have very different systematics. Okay, for sure, Virgo being the nearest galaxy clusters have a lot of advantages. But then again, you can see only like a very small fraction of cluster outskirts is covered, which tells us that the result is likely to be not representative. Um, so we don't know which one is correct yet, but uh, um, if this alpha to iron bounds ratio is, con con is constant from centers to outskirts, it means that the entire intercluster medium have been enriched from the same source and likely is some process um, before the cluster formed. And if the alpha to iron bounds ratio increase from centers to the outskirts, um, it is telling us that, okay, maybe the outskirts is enriched early on by, by some source that it has a pattern of um, high alpha to iron abundance ratio, but the center is a mix of the earlier enrichment and later BCG enrichment and happen to, to produce a um, solar abundance pattern. And we don't know which one is correct. And I would say that, um, and I think uh, um, in the future that LIM and line emission mapper um, is with a very large effective um, area and um, and uh, and to large field of view is likely to um, capture the balance pattern of cluster outskirts um, and tell us which scenario is is correct. Um, however, it's also interesting that we recently studied a uh, merging cluster where we see that the BCG and the X-ray P has been dissociated due to the recent merger. And in this cluster, we found out that the, the uh, X-ray peak has the solar abundance ratio, but the BCG itself, its ISM, has a subsolar ab abundance ratio. And so this study kind of tells us maybe the contribution of BCG to the cluster center may be, may be limited. Um, Okay, with that, I'm going to just um, conclude my uh, my talk here today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, we will take questions from our in-person audience first. Okay, all right, one second. Hi, again. This is Mila. Um, so, um, so for the first, I mean, all of it is oh, okay. All all this work is really interesting. But let's, starting with the first half, right? Um, the key result seems to be that um, by breaking down your gender image by energy band, you're able to decompose it into filaments and cavities, and then you know, and the sloshing pattern, right? Can you tell us about why that works? Because that's not immediately obvious to me. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so um, it, this is a blind uh, blind source separation algorithm. We provide uh, like a minimum as minimum requirement as 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 possible. The only thing we tell the algorithm is how many components we want it, and uh, then it will just um, search for structures in the in the in the in the three D space. And find the like which in which is is correct is 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 related, and uh, um to to single out how many components are uh, to single out which which components which, um so it I and we did uh, experiment this uh, like how many components is is optimal and uh, that um but we but we think that uh, for for cluster centers we think is three components um is 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 very um is is a, give us a very good result in terms of uh, analyzing the uh, the elements of each alpha emitting elements with uh, by the radiation from the hot gas have you estimated 
there's really enough blood from the heart now because it's often it's kind of difficult unless you have a, a UV, which they're obviously not very direct. All right, didn't hear very clearly. Can you can you repeat that? Okay, did you um in terms of uh the idea that the H alpha emitting filaments are ionized by the radiation from the hot gas, have you estimated whether you know how how easy that is to get enough flux to do that ionization? Um it seems like it could be quite difficult. I mean you're not you're not observing the extreme ultraviolet radiation that's doing the ionization. You're just observing the uh X-rays, which are pretty inefficient, ionism. Right. Yeah, we just observe the X-ray. Yeah. So this is still a. I would say it's it's still a. It's, I mean, it's we 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 demonstrate those two are definitely related, and uh, we we demonstrate that the process analyzing the. Um, H alpha filaments is local, but um, but we we still don't know exactly how. Oops, I, I think it would be interesting also to compare to 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 combine some of the um, um, X ray tail studies um, with cluster center studies if they are if they are truly related. Okay, let me just check if there's any hands. Um, yeah, I don't see anyone in the chat. Any other questions from our in person audience? No? Okay, I don't see any questions online either. So thanks again for that great talk, Yanya. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the second speaker also remotely. Aikaya, can you please uh, share? Uh... Uh, hey. Is it good? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, good. Great. So, uh, so let me introduce you. So, uh, Kaya Mori is uh, our next speaker. So, he's currently research scientist at the Columbia Astrophysical Lab in New York. Uh, he got his bachelor at the uh, University of Tokyo, then a PhD in Columbia University, and then he had a postdoc uh, uh, position at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Astrophysics. So, uh, Kaya Le leads uh, uh, the new star uh, galactic survey group, the XP Galactic Science Teams, and also the Galactic TV Gamma Ray Source Collaboration. Um, research interest is very broad, uh, as a general under the general umbrella of high energy astrophysics, uh, X rays as, and above, and our galactic sources. So that is uh, encompassing X ray binaries and transients, CVs, pulsars, magnetars, pulsar with nebulae supernova remnants, pevatron, molecular clouds in the galactic center, star J star, Jupiter, and uh, so on. So the title of his talk today is The Zoo of Compact Objects and uh, X-ray Binaries in the Center of uh, Milky Way. Thank you so much for being with us. Kaya, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's great to be uh, here just remotely giving talk at CFA. I have been in this uh, field of uh, high energy astrophysics for many years. Well, I just realized I haven't been to a CFA before. So uh, nice to meet you, everybody. And then thanks for coming to my talk today. So I mean, I'm going to be talking about the compact objects and then their X-ray binaries in the galactic center. Um, let me start with uh, you know, my conversation with my wife a few years ago when the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Dr. Uh, Gez and Genzer. So she was asking me, uh, she's not in science, and she was asking me, uh, you, I know you work in the Galactic Center. Why didn't you win the Nobel Prize? Uh, I said, I was in the wrong wavelengths. I work in X-rays. Uh, they work in infrared. And then she was also asking me, uh, why do you still work on the Galactic Center when someone else took the Nobel Prize? Because there are so many you know, interesting things to do in the Galactic Center and they're also in the X-ray band. 
So I'm going to talk about uh, some part of this big story, what's happening in the X-ray band. Um, this 25 minute talk is too short uh, to talk about this profound uh, problem of compact objects populations in the galactic center. If you have any questions uh, and then have a short conversation, please set up a Zoom meeting with me. I'm happy to talk about anything I'm going to be covering today. So let me start with why do we study the galactic center uh, besides the Nobel Prize in physics? So it's the most crowded region in our galaxy. So that means there's so many things happening. There are so many objects, uh, you can name it, you know, uh, stars, uh, filaments, clouds, gas, um, you know, compact objects, anything you want. I know it's already there. Uh, it's in a very crowded region. So uh, also this is a very unique environment where compact objects are formed and then they interact with a supermassive black core uh, at such as a star and then uh, other stars. And then this is also the best place to find new and exotic uh, objects. So let me define the galactic center region. So it depends on who you ask. So if you're talking to uh, you know, infrared people, they are talking about the center point one parsec region just around such as a star, you know, tracking the star's motions. But in the X-ray band, I think we do refer the galactic center as something like the central two by 0.8 degree, which you can see on the bottom. So this is a beautiful, almost artistic uh, image of the galactic center uh, um, you know, observed by radio, uh, Meerkat Observatory, and also Chandra. So um, yeah, so this is usually referred as a galactic center, but Galactic center has different regions. First of all, you have the supermassive black core at the center. And then within the three parsecs uh, region, the immense gravity of the supermassive black core can influence the, you know, these uh, <clears throat> stars and the motions and the binary formations. It's something called the you know, inference radius. It's around three parsecs. Basically, it's um, 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 GM over uh, sigma squared when sigma is the uh, uh, velocity dispersion. And then you can see in different wavelengths, uh, you know, filaments in the radio and X-ray, the star clusters, clouds and SNRs and PWN. Uh, but again, uh, if you look at the center of 10 parsec, there is a big cluster of uh, stars. It's called a nuclear clusters, uh, star clusters, NSCs. Um, and then I just do want to point out that the galactic center is not visible in the optical and UV and the soft X-ray band below 2 kV because of the um, large amount of dust uh, and, and atoms absorbing and scattering all these lights. So you need to go beyond uh, 2 kV to study all these uh, compact objects, especially. So let me just show you the X-ray image of the same region, 2 by 0.8 degree. So uh, this is a beautiful Chandra image uh, made by uh, Wang et al. back in 2002. And then uh, also uh, Muno et al. studied this uh, region in 2009. So Chandra detected uh, bunch of uh, X-ray point sources and diffuse emissions. Some of the bright uh, sources here and there, they are basically X-ray transients. Otherwise you see some diffuse emission near the center and then bunch of uh, point sources. So if I overlay the detected uh, point sources uh, with Chandra, there are 10,000 of them. Uh, you can see all these green dots. So there are many X-ray sources detected around such as SESA near the center because of a higher source density. The source density goes like one over R if you take the same uh, luminosity threshold. And also they spend a longer exposure time uh, staring at the Sagittarius A star for the flare science. So they accumulated almost a 6 million second Chandra exposure time just around the center of uh, region. So let's zoom into like a center of four parsec region. So Chandra detected about 400 uh, X-ray point sources, as you can see in green dots. Um, so other than the X-ray point sources, you do see some diffuse emission. Um, that's a soft X-ray uh, thermal emission from Sag A East, supernova remnant. And you can also see some X-ray pyramids. Okay, then um, I just want to talk about what's been done to study the galactic center sources in the X-ray band. Uh, so I would say um, Chandra Swift and New Star in XMM and then Suzaku uh, some time ago 
played a very important role to do a, a great job uh, in a complementary way. So like I said, Chandra is very good at resolving point sources. They detected over 10,000 sources in the, in the two by 0.8 degrees region. And then uh, SWIFT uh, telescope is uh, monitoring the galactic center just around the Sagittarius A star every single day. Uh, since uh, 2014 or 15, I believe. Um, it used to be every three days, but now it's more frequent, like you know, every single day. Uh, this program is uh, led by Natalie Degenar uh, and her team, and then we have some collaboration between them. So I'm leading a more like a you know, new star collaboration of uh, studying the galactic center. So new star can play two roles. Okay, number one, uh, Chandra's um, energy band goes up to 8 kb. So you just want to see what's beyond 8 kb. X, uh, X-ray transients, and then uh, sometimes flares from such as a star. So uh, we can do some follow-up TROs and then obtain a broadband X-ray spectroscopy and timing data. And I do want to mention that XMM also played a very important role, especially for the diffuse X-ray emission studies, like the molecular clouds, X-ray chimney studies by my collaborator, Gabriel Ponti. So uh, there are lots of uh, uh, progress done by the uh, modern X-ray uh, telescope so far. So let me tell you about the two approaches to study individual galactic center X-ray sources. The first approach is to say, um, Chandra detected all these X-ray sources, um, persistent emission, quiescence. So let's just look at uh, each one of them. Uh, if they have enough counts, uh, about a few hundred counts or thousand counts, you can do a decent X-ray spectroscopy and a variability uh, uh, study. So this can be done by Chandra and Newstein XMM. Uh, so what we are looking for is for individual sources, if you have enough counts, you can just make a spectra like this. So they should either have a uh, summer spectra with a big ion lines between six and seven kb. So uh, in this case, there are CVs, uh, white dwarf binaries. Uh, otherwise, sometimes you see uh, sources with a non-summer spectra with a featureless power of spectra like this, uh, this case. So they're indicated to be a black core neutron star binaries or maybe pulsars. Uh, the other approach is to uh, look at the X-ray transient. So like I said, the SWIFT XRT is monitoring the galactic center every single day. So far, so they detected about 20 transients over the last uh, 15 years or so. So we can follow up with a new star channel and XMM uh, TOOs to uh, have a more detailed studies. Okay, let me talk about uh, white or binaries or CVs first. So I would say there have been about 1,000 um, CVs have been detected and almost identified uh, through uh, uh, long-term uh, um, X-ray studies. So uh, CVs have different kinds. Um, if the magnetic field is not so strong, they are called uh, non-magnetic CVs. But I'm talking about the magnetic CVs uh, because they are abundant X-ray sources. So there are two types. Uh, one is intermediate polars. Uh, we call it IPs. So they have a strong magnetic field somewhere between 0.1 and 10 megagauss. So that because the magnetic field is strong, it's gonna truncate the inner part of the accretion disk. And if the magnetic field is more higher, um, it's called something called a polars. So the magnetic field of the white dwarf is around 10 to 240 megagauss. Uh, these guys, uh, these magnetic fields have been uh, very, very measured from a local polars in the optical and then uh, uh, UV uh, spectroscopy uh, data through a cyclotron line measurements. So uh, both uh, IPs and polars do emit uh, copious X-rays uh, through the macro mass acquisition going into the white dwarf and then emit X-rays. So uh, let me just uh, talk about uh, how uh, these magnetic CV actually emit X-rays. So we did some modeling here. Um, so you have a companion star losing some uh, you know, mass onto the white dwarf. So the accretion flow, are, flow is channeled along the magnetic field lines. And then eventually free falling gas from the standoff shock, like you see in this cartoon, and it gets heated. And then flow keeps going down and then they radiate away um, some of the you know, kinetic energy through the thermal Bramstrong emission and also cyclotron emission if the magnetic field is large. 
and eventually they hit the white dwarf surface. And the heated white dwarf surface can emit uh, additional soft X-ray uh, black body like emission. So we built this uh, model for the MCB spec uh, in XPEC. So what we did, did we solved the differential equations to uh, obtain the temperature and density profiles in this accretion column from the standoff shock to the all the way down to the white dwarf surface. And then we integrated the X-ray emissivities uh, to obtain the spectrum like this. So this spectrum is actually sensitive to a white dwarf mass and then some other factors that what, you know, like you no know, magnetic field. So let me go back to the Chandler sources. So if you simply stack up all these Chandler sources, uh, this is done by Muno and all back in 2005, uh, this is what you see. So you see a bunch of atomic lines, especially very strong ion lines between six and seven keV. So these spectra, stack to spectra are nothing but summer. And the plasma temperature is around eight keV. But uh, this is actually stacking all these sources, but there could be non summer sources or higher temperature sources, lower temperature sources blended in. So you need to really do the individual source analysis, and then we need hard X ray coverage because the, uh, the Chandler energy, you know, energy band cuts off at 8 kV. So that's where New Star came in. So uh, shortly after New Star was launched, we did. Uh, um, some baseline uh, survey of the galactic center covering about two thirds of the Chandra two by 0.8 degree regions. Um, one third of the other region was not really observable because we have a higher straight light background. But otherwise, um, New Star detected uh, 77 uh, hard X ray sources, about 10 kV. This is uh, one of the baseline, New Star baseline papers written by Jason Pond. Maybe he's in the audience today. Um, so uh, it turned out that most of these sources are magnetic CBs with a plasma temperature around 20 keV or above. So this is done by JSOP. And then uh, we renewed this study recently because uh, some of these uh, new star sources with the Chandra counterparts may have uh, bright IR counterparts. So that indicates they may be HMXBs. So we found a few candidate uh, HMXBs among seven in seven new star sources. Uh, so we have a paper in prep. Um, so that's what we found out from these uh, new star sources. So um, <clears throat> this is not the end uh, of the Galactic Center story. Uh, again, my collaborator, Gabriel Ponti's group is doing a more extensive Chandra and XMM survey beyond the central region. So they are finding more IPs, uh, magnetic CVs. So uh, we published uh, two papers recently. Um, they, they discovered two IPs and one uh, eclipsing IP. So we applied this MCB spec model, which I discussed uh, just a bit uh, before, and then it allowed us to measure the white of masses of these objects. So it turned out to be these uh, IPs uh, in the galactic center and just a little bit beyond have a white dwarf masses of around one solar mass. And then um, if you look at the local CVs, the average white dwarf masses of the CV is around 0.8 solar mass. So we are in the higher energy, a higher mass rate, rate, uh, range. And then eventually we might find uh, heavier CVs close to the Chandra Sekar limit around 1.4 solar mass uh, because the galactic center has lots of CVs. So uh, it has some implications for uh, type 1a supernova progenitors. To do this, uh, I would say uh, covering the both the soft X-ray band and hard X-ray band with Chandra XMM mu star is very important because um, you can really measure the mass in a broad band and then shock temperature is proportional to M over R and that's coming from the hard X-ray. So new star data really played an you know, important role to measure the white dwarf masses. Okay, so um, if you go back to the center of 10 parsec, that's where the new star, uh, sorry, nuclear star cluster is you know, residing. So new star detected a diffuse hard X emission above 20 kV back then. So this is the, one of our press release pictures. You know, uh, that's the new star, 20 to 40 kV image, just showing you this diffuse emission coinciding with the new star, uh, sorry, a nuclear star cluster region around uh, 10 parsecs uh, from Sagittarius A star. So at that time, you we were scratching out, okay, so what could it be? 
And then we did some studies, uh, actually looking at the Chandra data and the XMM data from the same region. And then uh, it's uh, most likely to be an unresolved population magnetic CBs. Uh, we had a follow-up paper, uh, Haley et al. back in 2016. And more recently, Ju et al. paper studied the Chandra sources within the same region. And they basically confirmed, OK, um, this the X-ray emission in the new star cluster and nuclear star cluster is made of all these uh, magnetic CBs. And then we can also measure the mean mass, uh, white off mass of this uh, diffuse emission, uh, and then it's consistent with the local CBs. So uh, there should be uh, hundreds of CBs um, not resolved, but emitting hard X-rays in the central stem process. So that's why all in all, there should be about 1,000 uh, CBs, magnetic CBs uh, in the galactic center so far. Let me talk about the neutron star so, uh, next. And then uh, based on what we know, I would claim there are only 11 uh, neutron stars detected. Uh, if you're a neutron star fan, uh, it's not much, but uh, I will just tell you, what, you know, one by one. So let me start with a cannonball. It's a runaway neutron star. Uh, the multi-epoch radio observations uh, detected uh, the, the proper motion of this uh, neutron star. You can see it, it's on in the tip of this uh, radio uh, observation data. It's done by Zhao et al. 2013. And then if you track back this motion, it's going back to such as A East SNR. So it's the, as, you know, it's the association with this uh, uh, Sage East. And then you start observed uh, the cannonball um, in the survey and we detected the non thermal X-rays up to 30 kV. So the pulsation has not been detected yet, but based on uh, the morphology, you know, how fast it moves, and then uh, non summer emission in the X-ray band, um, it is a neutron star uh, moving fast. Okay, let me talk about three parts of wind nebula. Um, so one of them is called the G0.9.1. It's about one degree away from the center. So it's one of the brightest TV gamma ray sources. This is a very TAS TV map, and you can see uh, 0.9 uh, plus 0.1 PWN here. Um, and then there are two other X-ray filaments with point-like sources uh, within it. Uh, okay, then uh, that's one of the filaments. Uh, this uh, filament was studied by uh, Shuo Zhan, and you can see a point source uh, here. Again, the pulsation has not been detected, but based on the X-ray morphology, it's very likely that it's a PWN, unlike other X-ray filaments. Okay, then we have one magnetar uh, right next to such as Zesta, only 0.1 parsec away. So uh, this is the, one of the beautiful stories, you know, the SWIFT has been monitoring the galactic center and new stuff followed up. So we published two papers, the first, the SWIFT discovery of this transient, and then I published a follow-up new star, you know, uh, paper, uh, which detected a 3.76 second pulsation. And then uh, we kept tracking this magnet for a while with new star, we detected P, P and P dot, and then that gave me a dipole B field of 1.6 and 10 to the 14 dots. So it's confirmed to be a magnet R. And then let's talk about the neutron star binaries. Uh, there have been six confirmed neutron star binaries by detecting type 1 X-ray bursts. So this is done uh, by uh, Degener et al, Conti et al, and many other people. So um, I do want to mention that all of the six confirmed neutron star binaries have a short recurrence time less than five years uh, for the X-ray outgrowth. I'm gonna come back to this point later. Okay, uh, so if you plot all these neutron star binaries and PWN, it looks like you know, they are spreading out all the way up to you know, 50 parsecs away. So it kind of makes sense because neutron stars are ejected by supernova nature kicks and then like you see in the cannonball, and then there are some theories you know, calling that uh, neutron stars born in the new star cluster, a uh, nuclear star cluster, they get ejected by some gravitational interaction with other stars, so occasionally. So uh, that's another way to you know, just kick out the neutron stars out of the uh, very center. But I do wanna give you a caveat that, uh, okay, I just said 11 neutron stars, but that's not all, because there should be a large population of neutron stars, faint and then soft X-ray emission. Uh, they cannot be detected uh, in the X-ray band because below 2 kV, X-rays -ray, X are heavily absorbed. Okay, let me uh, finish with the black hole binaries. 
uh, I'm claiming that we should have uh, 16 black hole binaries uh, detected so far. So let me start with our uh, transients. Um, so here's another story of, you know, a success story of uh, Swift and the new star follow up TOs. So back in 2016, very luckily we detected, and uh, Swift detected two X-ray transients. Chandra followed up and they uh, localized these transients and they turned out to be new transients, okay? And not repeating ones. And then new star obtained the broadband X-ray spectra you can see on the bottom. Um, you, uh, as you can see this big uh, asymmetric uh, uh, ion line. So this is the relativistic broadband ion line. So when we fit the rare zero model, developed by Javier Garcia and companies. Uh, we turned out that the you know, black hole spin was quite high, 1.9. I think this is consistent with other black hole uh, transients uh, detected elsewhere uh, with the black hole spin measurements. And there are other two black hole uh, transients detected in the past. Um, at that time, there was no new star, <clears throat> but they had a radio detection during the hard states and based on um, I think it's one of the smoking guns for the black hole transients. So you should have a um, higher radio emission during the hard states. Uh, this is the paper by Garo et al. 2013. And I think it's well received as one of the smoking guns for the black holes. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I mentioned another approach of like, just studying a persistent X-ray sources. So we analyzed 20 years of Chandra ISIS data with a total exposure of 6 million seconds. So <clears throat> what we have done is we picked up uh, 400 Chandra sources uh, with a secure detection as a point sources, and they have a decent number of counts within the 10 parsecs. And then most of them are actually thermal sources with atomic lines, you know, especially ion lines. But we found out that 12 sources have a featureless and a power like spectra, like you see on the bottom here. And then uh, because Chandra has a very long baseline now, almost uh, 20 years, we found that the nine of them are variable. So that indicates they are you know, X-ray binaries, not CBs. <clears throat> so what are these uh, 12 non thermal X-ray sources? So we did a bunch of tests. Uh, first of all, is this one of these uh, horse, uh, horsely identified thermal sources? Uh, no, we run a bunch of you know, uh, mark simulations in the galactic center. And then the, such a property is less than one source. AGN, no, it's less than 0.1. CVs, uh, maybe one of them could be CVs, like a SS6 type with a low ion abundance. MSPs, American parsers, maybe three of them because uh, these resources have not shown uh, any variability yet uh, using a 20 years of a Chandra data. So it really comes down to two possibilities. One is black hole MSPs or neutron cell MSPs. So uh, we published two papers about this topic. And then uh, we are claiming that the black hole LMXP scenario is the most plausible case. Uh, why? <clears throat> so first of all, none of these that 12 non thermal sources have not outbursted in the past 15 years. Again, SIFT is looking at the galactic center and these sources every single day. None of them outbursted in the past 15 years. And then uh, I was talking about the six neutron state LMXPs confirmed. They all have a short recurrence time less than five years. Again, detected by uh, SWIFT. And then uh, four black hole transients I mentioned two slides ago, uh, they have uh, at least 15 years or longer in the recurrence time. So um, this trend of black hole transients having very long in the recurrence time versus short neutron star MXPs uh, recurrence time, it actually was observed in other uh, systems outside the galactic center. Nearby, you know, galactic, uh, sorry, nearby transients, uh, that could be uh, observed by all sky monitors uh, like Maxi and then Swift, but it seems like that's the similar trend. So I'm not denying, you know, it could be a rare neutron star MX with a very long recurrence time, like saying X4, it's a possibility. But as a whole, as a population, I would say most of them should be black hole MXPs. And then there are some heated discussions between my paper back in 2001. Tom Macaron wrote another paper against this interpretation. I will have a response paper. So if you want to know about this topic, uh, please read our papers. Uh, uh, I think we have a very subtle uh, response. Okay, so if you believe what I said, where are these you know, 16 or mostly 16 black hole binaries are located? They're all located within the one parsecs, uh, not, 
not beyond, okay, up to like you know, four parsecs. And then uh, we also build the X-ray luminosity function out of 12 sources. And if you extend this down to uh, L mean from a local black hole uh, LMXPs or the upper limit uh, uh, X-ray luminosity of these X-ray transients, black hole transients I just discussed. And then there should be about 300, 600 black, black hole binaries within the one power set. So uh, also very interesting, there are spatial distributions um, elongated and aligned with the new star, a new nuclear star cluster. So um, since we wrote these papers, there have been a lot of uh, discussions about uh, how you know this you know the black hole distribution is consistent with some theories and anybody simulation. So that's another story. Okay, so this is my last slide. I'm running out of time. So uh, I just told you the, some little shallow story about what we know about the, gap, the compact object in the, you know, from the X-ray observations. So there's a strong caveat here. Um, I mentioned 1,000 magnetic CBs, 11 neutron stars, and the possibly 16 uh, black hole binaries, but that's not reflecting the true number of underlying the population. So there could be a lot more um, of these sources. Uh, so we, um, I have to stop here, I guess. And then you can see on the bottom, um, so I plotted what we know about these compact objects and populations of different types as a function of uh, uh, distance from such a star and X-ray luminosities. And I will stop here and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very informative, and we have no excuse not to know what, how many of the sources are in the galaxy center. So um, is there any question from the in-person people? Yeah. Hi, hi, it is Ezra. Nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, the mass of the magnetic CV. I vaguely remember uh, the, you guys seeing some enhanced mass near the galactic center region, but the, you just also mentioned that within a 10 parsec, now there's a, some claims the, uh, the mass is consistent with the local population, 0.8 solar mass or something. So what was what initial hint that we thought there is a higher mass magnetic CVs near the galactic center region? Is that just the selection bias which gone away or uh, is there any other sort of, uh, that, that trend still stays? If so, then what would be the uh, reason behind it? Yeah, so Jason, that's a great question. So we, we should be talking about the white dwarf mass distribution, okay? And then the central hard X-ray diffuse emission is made of hundreds of you know, magnetic cities with different mass distribution. So if you combine them or and then fit the MCB spec or something, you do get just the you know, mean white dwarf masses. But some of the uh, magnetic CVs in the central 10 parsec region could be uh, massive, right? But it's impossible because new star cannot resolve these you know, point source in the central 10 parsec region. But the massive CVs I was talking about, it's far away from the 10 parsecs. It's almost 100 parsecs somewhere even beyond. And then, um, so they're detected by XMM survey, uh, Gabriel Pontes survey. So there is no particular bias toward the massive CVs. Unlike the John Tom's you know, integral source survey. So they're actually you know, following up with you know, the integral source you know, follow up with the Chandra and the new star. And then new integral sources that tend to be harder sources. That means there's a bias toward the massive CVs, right? So you have to be a little bit careful here. And then probably the same for the new star source in the center. But uh, I'm talking about XMM survey, finding more IPs. So there's no bias in that sense. And then for one of them, we followed up with new star and then the, ma you know, the mass turned out to be one solar mass. So I think we just need to keep doing this unbiased, the big survey with XMM or Chandra and then follow up with new star. Thank you. Any more questions? from the in-person people. Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the uh, new star proposal yesterday. Uh, and secondly, uh, uh, it seems that the new star has a lower sensitivity that limits the source that you can detect it and also the, uh, the large PSF. So it seems that Haxby can do more about it. 
Uh, sorry, you, you mentioned the Higgs B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, great, great question. I don't have any, I, I have a slide, but I, I don't know where it is, but uh, we did the um, Higgs B simulations of the magnetic CBs in the galactic center. And then um, uh, just in summary, we should be able to measure the white dwarf masses of at least 100, all these 77 of, uh, new star sources just have discovered at least like 100 uh, magnetic seed in the galactic center to 10 to 15% accuracy. And that's great because we can make a very precise white dwarf mass distribution from 100 magnetic CVs just from the galactic center with hex B. And the exposure time could be as short as something like you know, 20 kiloseconds or 30 kiloseconds. So we did random simulations for, for this uh, uh, mm -hmm. science. Thank you. Any more questions? Not see any online. Let's see. Hands. Can okay, see any hands? Okay, so let's thank both our speakers again. And see you next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Into yeah. the session. Okay.